Man, over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about all things love. Dating, marriage, sex, all that good stuff. Why? Because I think it's important that you know what God's Word has to say about these things. Because let me clue you into something. In case you haven't figured it out, the world has assaulted God's design of marriage. The world has assaulted his concept of dating. The world has assaulted his gift of intimacy. And as a result, so many people have a distorted view of what marriage, dating, and sex should look like. Unfortunately, it seems that we've allowed the world to teach and shape how we view these things. But the world shouldn't be teaching the church. The church should be teaching the world. And so our goal over the next several weeks is going to be to change whatever distorted view we may have of these concepts, what the world claims they should be, over to a clear view from God's Word of what these concepts were created to be with the purpose of raising up amongst your generation godly men and godly women who come together to form godly marriages that build godly homes and raise godly kids. It's springtime. Love is in the air. We're going to have some fun with this over the next few weeks. Here's the series First comes love, then comes marriage. Being only a week removed from Valentine's Day, I found some interesting Valentine's stats that I want to share with you. Here's some of the numbers from Valentine's Day. The average spending for Valentine's Day from a year-to-year -year basis is $13.2 billion. So over the course of Valentine's Day on a yearly basis, Americans will spend, on average, in a cumulative sense, $13.2 billion. It's reported that 3 out of 10 people will go into credit card debt on Valentine's Day. Some of you girls are like, that definitely wasn't my boyfriend. <laughs> $192 is the average amount of money people spend individually on that day. The average number of roses produced for Valentine's Day specifically is $224 million. I found this one to be particularly sad. 15% of women will send themselves flowers. Forty-six percent of people on Valentine's Day will be displeased with their gift. It's estimated that there are around annually six million engagements on Valentine's Day. And then kind of to cap it off, just because I thought this one was funny, roughly 19 to 20 percent of people buy a gift for their pet on Valentine's Day that averages out to over annually two billion dollars being spent on pet valentines some of y'all sitting here right now looking around like ah who in the world would do such a thing knowing good and well you bought your pet a valentine this valentine day hey here's what i know i know that the way in which you choose to spend your valentine's day typically depends on your status and in this room we have three levels of relationship statuses represented. Those who are married, those who are single, and those who are dating. And the status that I want us to kick this series off with tonight is going to be on the single side. So let's meet up in 1 Corinthians, and in specifically chapter 7. Now, as we find ourselves there, Paul has been talking about some principles for marriage. And then right in the middle of that, he kind of takes a time out from talking to the married people. He's going to address the singles in the room. So check out what he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 6. He writes to these believers, Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind, and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. 
For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Let's talk about the gift of singleness tonight. Because whether you have ever realized it or not, Scripture does indeed call being single a gift. Unfortunately, singleness is never really recognized in that way. As a matter of fact, when I look around in the context of our culture and in our world, the world seems to treat singleness like it's some kind of a disease. Like single people are lepers that should be cast out at the city gates or whatever and not let back in. Like there's some kind of just weird negative connotation around being single. And the world will blame your singleness on a few things. Primarily, it's going to blame it on physical looks. You're single because you can't attract somebody to enter into a relationship with. It'll also blame it on personality problems. Or quirkiness. So you must be single because you're weird or something. Like otherwise, somebody would have been happy to link up with you by now, but you got some kind of weird personality thing. I don't know, like some kind of quirk, and that's for whatever reason, nobody is attracted to that. There's another layer that the world will add on to this. You must be single because of some kind of more than likely career choice that you have made. That is not very lucrative to attracting somebody to spend their life with you because it's not going to provide the kind of living they want to have with the person that they spend the rest of their life with. And so the single kind of puts this, this the world kind of puts this, this disease, this, this nasty tag on being single. And then we get into the context of the church. And I apologize to you single people because the church hasn't really done you any favors either. Because within the church, all we ever seem to hear or talk about is how great marriage is. What a beautiful picture of the gospel it portrays. Well, I'm telling you, marriage is just awesome. And we'll have all kinds of marriage retreats and marriage conferences and the single people sitting in the room thinking, when are we going to have something for the single people up in the house? Like, when are we going to have that singles conference? When are we going to have the singles retreat? Like, Let's get up on some of that. But all the church seems to do is go on and on and on and on and on about, man, you got to get married. you got to find somebody to spend it. It's like one of the greatest things God's ever given. Like, you can't, you can't more adequately portray a picture of the gospel than being married. How are you going to portray the gospel and be single? And they go on and on and on about how, how having a family. Once you get married, you gotta get, you got to get married because you got to have a family. Why? Because having a family, man, just gives you such a greater appreciation and understanding of the Father's love. Like, I never really knew how deep the Father's love for us was until I got married and had kids. And once again, all the single people are like, good for you, man. Good for you, girl. And so we kind of just back single people into a corner. So if you're single and things just don't seem to be working out for you, it can feel like a lose-lose situation. That's why when it comes to seeing singleness as a gift, you need to know that perspective is everything. So let's go back into the text for a second. Paul says in verse 6, Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Paul had the right perspective about being single and really is a good authority to speak to it. Why? Because he was. He was single. Paul never did marry. He never did find a woman to spend the rest of his life with. He was a single man. And here's what I need you to know tonight up front just dealing with the blunt truth of it, not everyone will end up being married. The reality is you may never say yes to the dress. The reality is you may never get down on one knee. Listen to me. And that's okay. That's okay. If it never works out for you to find somebody to spend your life with in the covenant relationship of marriage, that's okay. You're not diseased. You don't have something wrong with it. It's not a personality thing. 
as a matter of fact, I would say it's a purpose thing. It's fine if you don't end up being married one day. And according to verse 7, Paul says, I wish that everyone could experience life like me as a single. So Paul's perspective towards being single is vastly different than what we hear coming from a cultural context. He says, he's talking to the man. He says, hey, I wish that all y'all were like I am. Y'all, y'all need to be single like I single is where it's at. But for most people, it's the other way around. They don't want that experience. And why? Because they've been told or they equate being single as being lonely, unwanted, unloved, all these kind of negative things that come along with it. Let me just give you a little bit of encouragement. Are you single people in the room? Yeah, I know we're going to, this series is going to go way deeper than just this. This is just to get us started. But can I just give you an encouragement tonight? If, if, if God has set it apart for you to be single for his glory, stop letting what people say about your life shape your life. There's only one voice that should speak over and shape your life. That's the voice of your Savior. What's it matter what everybody else around us wants to say or do or tell us we need to be a part of? Stop letting what people say about your life shape your life. Let Christ handle that for those of you who are his children. Paul saw singleness differently than most because God had given him a different perspective. As a matter of fact, if you pay attention closely to what he says, he says each has his own gift from God. You married people, you have that marriage as a gift from God. You single people, you have your single status as a gift from God. And I know that can be kind of a difficult thing to grasp and understand and see how that could possibly be the case. But this is exactly how his perspective saw what God had called him into. He says, my singleness is a gift from God. That's fine. Your marriage is. My singleness is as well. Let me show you this. Since we're talking about it in the context of a gift, the way in which you value your gift will often depend upon the way in which you view your gift. Now, let me give you a case in point. If someone gives you, let's say somebody gives you cash as a present, maybe on a a birthday or for a Christmas present or something like that, if it's something along those lines, then more than likely you'll be appreciative of it, but at the same time you'll kind of see that as being an an insensitive thing. Like that, that wasn't very thoughtful. Like you didn't have to put a whole lot into that. It kind of seems impersonal. It kind of seems lazy. It kind of seems uncaring. Like, listen, I'm never going to turn down cash if somebody wants to give it to me. But being that it's my birthday or being that it's Christmas or the holiday season, something like that, like, I don't, who wants to go into to Christmas morning and, and rip open the presents underneath the tree and find nothing but just a few bills there? I don't want to do that. I want something that's personal. I want something that somebody's put some thought into that says, hey, man, I, I love you and, I, and I've noticed that these are some things that you might like. And so if somebody hands you cash on one of those occasions, the way that you view that is going to be, ah, okay, that's, that's good, but I mean, you could have put a little bit more into it than that. But in the same sense, if someone gives you cash to help repair a sudden blown transmission in your vehicle that you did not have the money to cover, now all of a sudden that cash is viewed as amazing. This is awesome. I can't believe that you would bless me. Like I can't believe you would be so generous to give me such a thing. In both instances, money was given as a gift, but the perspective through which each gift was viewed completely changed how the value of that gift was seen. In the same sense, the perspective that you have as you look at your relationship status and how it may change or not change throughout the course of your life, it's only going to hold as much value as you learn to view it with. This perspective that, that God has placed this upon my life gives your singleness a significance. It completely changes the way in which you value that lifestyle. Now, instead of looking at my singleness as a burden, I can see it as a blessing. Now, instead of an outcast, I can see opportunity. That's why Paul, at the beginning of this, was able to look at these people and say, I wish that all of you were as I am. Why? Because Paul's perspective seems to be, I'm not missing out because I'm not married. You're missing out because you're not single. 
Now, how backwards is that compared to everything we've ever known or heard? It's because he had the right perspective. All these married people, when we talk about, man, till you get married, you're missing out. Like, you ain't got a husband, you ain't got a wife, you're missing out. Well, I think it's time maybe some of the single people start rising up and saying, no, because you got a husband, because you got a wife, you're missing out. You don't know about this freedom over here. One of the keys that Paul learned, I think, to be valuable in enabling him to live a life of singleness was contentment. And so if you're going to see this gift of singleness in a proper perspective, you've also got to see it through a lens of contentment. And so here's, here's the next layer to this. You've got to start learning to be content with celibacy. This might get a little tough, but we can work there by taking a deep breath. Let it out. Okay, we got this. Verse 8. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. Now, flip over a little bit if you have to in your pages, and let's get to verse 32. Paul tacks this on kind of at the end of what he's talking about with these people. He says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry. It's no sin. Being married has its benefits. But being single has its benefits as well. And seeing the benefits can help with gaining contentment. And so as Paul speaks to those who are unmarried, he says that it is good for them to remain single, which sounds absurd to most of us. Most of us, I would think, who were in this room tonight carrying a single status would probably struggle to agree with Paul's sentiments that it's good for me to stay there. Most of you are trying everything that you possibly can to not stay there, and that's fine. It's okay to do that as he has laid out for them, and we're going to get to that here in a minute, but he says it's good to remain that way if that's the situation that you find yourself in and it doesn't seem to be working out. But Paul had seen the benefits of a single and celibate life, and so he talks about what those are. And I want to pull out some of these things for you. In verse 32 and verse 35, like we just read, he is distinguishing between the things that married people have to deal with versus the things that unmarried people don't have to deal with, namely the fact that within a marriage, there comes marital responsibilities. Paul says with the single life, you ain't got none of that. And I'm going to give a list that he kind of excludes, but I think is understood. He starts out by saying that first off, a single life is one free from anxieties, which once again seems a little backwards. You're like, Paul, dude, I don't know what you're thinking, but I lay in bed at night anxious because I can't find somebody. And he's like, but you ain't seen the benefits yet. You not understand it. You ain't found contentment in it yet. So think about it like this. You're going to live a single life. You only ever have to buy half the food. You're going to live a single life. You only have to do half as much laundry. You're going to live a single life? You ain't got to share a bed or a bathroom with nobody. Y'all ain't no more excited about that? I don't understand. Y'all going to be married one day, and you're going to look back on this, and you'll be like, okay, the own bed and bathroom thing, I can kind of go for that now. Like, like, get off of me like I'm burning up hot. It is, I, I need some space. Every time you go in the bathroom, somebody's in the bathroom, like, you ain't got to worry. Paul says, I ain't got to worry about that. I want to go to bed, I a king-size bed. All of my stuff, I can flop all over that thing. I can cocoon myself in the covers, and nobody's trying to fight to get them back from me. I don't have to worry about when I go in the bathroom. I can spend as much time in there as I want. I ain't got to fight somebody over the toothbrush and the sink. He said, it's complete freedom. On top of that, guess what? If you want to go fish, go fish. 
If you want to go hunting, go hunting. You want to go play golf, go play. Ladies, you want to shop, go shop. You want to have a girl's night, go have a girl's night. You want to take a random trip or a vacation, go take it. You want to spend money, spend money. Just go and do. There ain't no asking permission. There ain't no collaborating of calendars. Let's sit down and have a family meeting to figure out what all we got to get planned out. Single people ain't got to worry. You just go do you whenever you want to do it. Paul says it ain't that bad. It's not that bad of a deal. But on the serious side, what Paul was really getting at was the spiritual implications of this life. He shows us that remaining single and celibate helps in keeping one completely devoted to the work of the Lord. This is the good stuff of the single life. He says married people are concerned about worldly things. Namely, he says, pleasing their spouse. He says, so the married man is concerned about pleasing his wife. And if that ain't some of the most profound, solid biblical truth I've ever heard in my life, I can testify that as a married man, you worried about keeping your wife happy. Y'all need to loosen up just a little bit. Like, happy wife, happy life, man. Like, we're going, y'all are about as stale as a piece of bread been left on the counter for two months. Like, we're going we're gonna to have some fun with this. Like, you got to understand that in a marriage, that is one of your main priorities as a husband is to make sure your wife is provided and protected and sustained, all those things. In the same sense, ladies, he says the married woman, she ain't concerned about things. She's concerned about pleasing her husband. Guess what, ladies? That's a full-time job and a half. You're going to have to work overtime. Not only are you going to have to work a job, you're going to have to come home and work a job by taking care of your husband because he's needy. Some of y'all don't know it yet, but you're going to find out. You're going to get a husband one day, and it's going to be a full-time job to take care of his sorry buddy. He's going to be leaving his clothes all over the house. There's going to be socks in places you ain't never seen socks. There's going to be underwear on top of the roof. Like, it's going to be chaos. you worried about taking care of your husband. He says on the flip side of that, the unmarried man and the unmarried woman is concerned about one thing, pleasing the Lord. In a single life, your full attention and focus does not get divided by the responsibilities that come with marriage. You don't have the anxieties, in other words, as Paul is saying, of making sure to care for and meet the needs of a husband or a wife or kids later on. Singleness places you in a unique position of service to God where you're available for every missional opportunity, every community service project. You can pack up and move to go help that church plant anytime you want. You can volunteer anytime for the soup kitchen. There's no let me run that by the spouse. Let's pray about this and see if we can make it work. There's just, here I am, Lord. What do you want from my life? Listen to me. There is nobody more available than the available. You are in a unique position where God can use your life in ways that would be far more difficult, if not impossible, for him to use those in marital relationships. That's the contentment side. When you look at that and you say, man, God, if you can use, if you desire to use me in such a way, I can be content with that. Now when we look back at verse 8, when he says to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. Now we can better understand why Paul says that it's good to remain single. Why? Because I can be wholly devoted to whatever service it is that God calls me to at any given moment in my life. There is a deal breaker in all this. That is in being able to, to live a single and celibate life, and that's your ability to exercise self-control over your body and your passions. So we're going to finish up by talking about passion problems for just a moment. For the single person, passion can be a problem. So in verse 9, Paul says that it's good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now let's skip down to verse 36. It says, If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, that his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It's no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, 
being under no necessity, but having his desire under control and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. Now, let's get something out of the way because we're going to have to deal with it moving forward, so we might as well deal with the awkwardness of it. We're all going to participate. It's a participatory exercise. So on the count of three, everybody in this room is going to say the word sex. Are you ready? One, two, three, sex. Thank you. Let's just get that out of the way. The desire to have sex is perfectly normal and perfectly right. Here's what I need you guys to so deeply understand. That is a God-given desire. And a good God only gives good gifts. So the desire to have sex, the drive to have sex, is a perfectly natural and normal and thus good desire. I'm so sick and tired of the fact that we as a church have sat back and let the world hijack what sex is and skew intimacy and pervert it to a point that it's almost beyond recognition as the good that God gave it to be. Sex was not the world's idea. Sex was God's creation. And we need to learn to honor it as such. That's a later session. But your desire, those sexual desires, that sexual drive, that's a God-placed thing. And it's perfectly fine and normal. All of us deal with it. But for the single person, this can present a unique challenge. If you find that you absolutely cannot control that desire, then Paul's advice to you is to continue looking for someone to marry. So he says, I understand we all have this desire. I understand that it it is a major, major drive within us as men and as women. And so if you find yourself being absolutely just unable to control those desires and those urges, then he says, my exhortation to you is for you to continue to find someone that you can then enter into a marriage relationship with, which is, by the way, the proper context for those desires and needs to be met and fulfilled. But... There's another side to this. Just remember that just as single is seen as being a gift, I believe it can also be seen as being a calling. And we talk about calling a lot within church and the context of the purposes and the plans and the paths that God is going to lay out for us. We might determine those things to be the calling he has placed upon our lives, a a calling to be a a pastor or a, a missionary or a teacher or a nurse or a doctor or an electrician or any one of those things God can fit and form as a calling for your life as your arena in which to serve him in. But I believe singleness can be viewed as such as well, a unique calling that God gives to certain people on this earth and if God is calling you into that lifestyle listen this is so big if God is calling you into that lifestyle he will provide you with the ability to control your desires on a higher level than most I believe it's not that he completely removes the desire but he will give you control over it And I believe that because of what Paul says in verse 37. He he says this, Whoever is firmly established in his heart. This is where I think he's speaking to the calling of singleness. He's speaking to people who say, you know what, I've I've searched and I've searched and I've searched, and the relationship thing just doesn't work for me. I I can't seem to find anybody. Nothing ever seems to, to last so maybe, maybe God is indeed calling me to live a life of singleness, and they have set their hearts upon that, I think. That they say, you know what, this is, I think this is the path that God has laid out for me. And that may not have necessarily been what I desired for myself, but I do believe it's what he has given me for his glory, and I'm firmly established in my heart in that. Being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, 
and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. So as Paul is talking about this, he says, if you are firmly established and determined in your heart to follow this calling, God will give you the ability to control your desires on such a high level. And he says, thus is the result. He says this, you will do well. You'll do well in this. You will do well to follow this. I don't know how God does the things that he does. And I think that's one thing that makes him God is our inability to rationalize or understand or explain the ways in which he works and the ways in which he moves within specific individuals' lives. This may seem like a far-fetched thing, but I have a personal close friend that has lived a life of singleness. We are the same age, and in preparation for this, I had a conversation with that person, and I asked them very pointedly about this very thing. How do you deal with the urge? Like, how do you deal with the desire? And their response back to me was just like what we just talked about. They were like, it's not that it's not there. It's just that I firmly believe that God has given me a unique ability to control it. You think God can't equip? Absolutely he can. And this person is dead set that this is the path and the purpose and the calling that God has placed upon their life, and they are perfectly content to walk in that. Listen, uh, when it comes to this whole singleness stuff, God will change your perspective on it if you'll allow him to. He will lead you into being content. He will give you power over your passions. And listen to me. You won't, this, this is in regards to anything. You won't recognize the full extent of the giftedness that he has placed in you if you refuse to accept the calling that he has placed upon you. I firmly believe that for living a life of singleness as well. You're never going to realize the full extent of how he can equip you in that giftedness if you'll never give yourself to it. If you'll like never accept that and acknowledge that maybe this is indeed what God has laid out for my life. I think, and I don't know, but in a room this size, God may very well be calling some of you to live a single life at some point. Maybe you haven't figured it out yet. Maybe it's not been confirmed or affirm to it and by all means look and search and and send valentines and and write notes and give flowers and send text or whatever and go out on dates until it comes apparent and obvious that this is not God's will for your life but at the same time if you do end up living a life of singleness I think it's very important that you understand that it's not for your personal punishment but for his glorious purpose And I think that's why Paul, at the very end of this conversation that he's had with these believers, he states, he who refrains from marriage will do even better. I don't know about you guys, but Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, which would, by in turn, translate to us as God speaking these things, I think it's safe to assume that God holds a life of singleness to be in very high honor. Not as something that's a punishment or a judgment, but something that is an honorable life to live that glorifies him while you're on this earth. And if you're single, stop stressing over it quite so much. By all means, seek and search. But at the same time, if God calls you to it, he'll equip you for it. And I think you'll find out as you get into it, it's really not that bad as this world wants to make it out to be.